encouragement and uh, comfort in difficult times. We ask that you forgive us of our sins, Father, because we know that we fall miserably short of what you expect of us. But uh, we'd ask that you pick us up when, you, when we stumble and help us to live more and more like Jesus each day. Be with us all, Father, as we travel to and from the meeting place this week and keep us safe. Keep us always in your protective care and help us to always, through the efforts that are made this week, be able to be better encouraged to live more like, like you would have us to each day. In Jesus' name, amen. On my dad's desk, <clears throat> there is a picture. And it is a picture of the guys participating in the first Southside lectures. And he treasures that picture. And in addition to the speakers that Brother Garner mentioned a while ago, D is in that picture, and RJ is in that picture. And my dad talks about those early days of the Southside Lectures, where for a while they used the same four speakers every other year. It was at that first lectureship in the old building that Brother Harold talked about his golf game. And then my dad got up and reminded Brother Harold of the Bible verse. He said, I used to play golf, but I put away childish things. <laughs> and then Brother Harold got up and said, Brother Adams, the Bible says, unless you become like little children. <laughs> You shall not inherit the kingdom. And that's how it all began. So good to be back at Southside. I just love y'all so much. Uh, so many friends here uh, from over the years and so many stories that we could certainly tell. But I appreciate you so very, very much. Look forward to being with these other guys this week and listening to them and being seated at their feet. And uh, appreciate them so, so very much. We'll say more about that as time goes on. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the third chapter of Exodus. We're going to go back to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1. It's going to be a scene that you know very well. But I think there are some lessons here that we can learn and apply to the overall theme of our time together this week. The gospel is for all. So begin reading with me in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horab, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire and yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt 
And I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them. Skip down to verse 10. Therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you. Verse 13. Then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they will say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Sadly, I see a lot of Christians who seem to be very bored. It's not that we don't have anything to do. We have plenty to do. But boredom, ladies and gentlemen, is not defined by just a lack of busyness. Boredom is defined by a lack of life mission. Boredom is defined by a lack of life purpose. You can have lots to do and still be bored. I think that's why the video gaming industry is so big. And I think that's why people get addicted to those things. And yet on a positive side, video games do give people a goal. They do give people a mission, a mini mission, M-I-N-I, but a mission nonetheless. But it is a mission without any risk. And so I can become a race car driver. I can become an assassin. I can become a fighter pilot. I can become an angry bird. I can become any of those things. There's no threat to my well-being. There's no real life adventure. There's no risk. It is just entertainment. Entertainment. In 1951, there was a guy by the name of Ray Bradbury who wrote a book entitled Fahrenheit 451. I had to read that book in high school. Maybe you did too. And the interesting thing about Bradbury's book, Fahrenheit 451, is that in that book, published in 1951, he previewed a 21st century culture where the people living in that time would become obsessed with entertainment. In fact, in that book, published in 1951, he talked about this futuristic society where televisions would be the size of the walls of the home. That will never happen. And in Fahrenheit 451, the firemen didn't put out fires. They started them by burning books because books were dangerous. And books would have ideas and books would challenge people to think for themselves. But as you read the book Fahrenheit 451, in this futuristic entertainment culture, the interesting thing is nobody's happy. They just exist from day to day. It's like something is about to destroy them, but no one looks up from their entertainment devices to even notice. So you fast forward 21 or 71 years from 1951, and we have televisions the size of our walls. And we binge on entertainment. And we carry movies in our pockets. And we carry music in our pockets. And not a second goes by of any day that we cannot, if we so choose, be entertained. And yet people are bored. If you're bored, there's something you need that no Netflix series is going to provide for you. No video game. No addictive application on your phone. You need a life mission. You need a life purpose. You need something that's real. You need something that you can pour your life into that is bigger than you are. You need something about which you are not just an observer on a screen. You are a participant and you're not just playing in a game. This is real life. 
You see, you were created on purpose and for purpose. And that for purpose is God's purpose. But before we can find out our purpose, there's something we have to see. We have to see what Moses saw. And what we have to see is that we serve a God who is not boring. And so it is in the book of Exodus. The great I am reveals himself to Moses as the God of the fire. And I wrote down three ways. Three ways. God is like fire. If you've got something to write with, something to write on, I want to give you three ways that Moses learned that God is like fire. Number one, write this down. Like fire is both dangerous and attractive. So is God's holiness. Like fire is both dangerous and attractive, so is God's holiness. Strange thing about fire, when you see it, it draws you in. Fire pulls you toward it. And yet you understand that if you get too close to the fire, you will get burned. And so fire is attractive, it pulls you in, but it is also dangerous like God. Take Moses. Moses was busy, but he was bored. Moses was a sheep herder. Moses had a job. Moses had a responsibility to fulfill. Sheep herding is not exactly an eight to five, five day a week, clock in, clock out kind of job. So Moses did not lack for something to do. Moses had plenty to do every day. What Moses lacked was mission. And so it is in verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire and yet the bush was not consumed. The fire caught his eye. The fire caused him to turn aside. It mesmerized him. It captured his attention. And he began to walk toward it to investigate. And that's when God called his name, verse 4, Moses, and then with an exclamation, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near. As Moses begins to walk to the bush that is burning, the voice from the bush says, stop. Don't get any closer. For you are standing on holy Holy ground. Do you ever notice we struggle sometimes with the word holy? Because sometimes in conversation with one another, when we think holy, it's easy to go to pretentious. We talk about somebody being holier than thou. We know what that means. But that's not what this means. God is a different kind of holy. God is an other kind of holy. God is a set-apart kind of holy, which is the core definition of holy. And so rather than holier than thou, what we have in our God is holy art thou, because holy is who he is. Holy is his character. Holy is his nature. And so the fire of God's holiness makes him at once attractive, but also makes him dangerous. What happens when you take something and you throw it into the fire? Well, the fire burns it. The fire consumes it. The fire melts it, turns it to ashes. And that's why the voice came from the bush as Moses drew near, and the voice said, stop, do not get any closer. 
Because, folks, the combination of God's holy fire and your unholy sin will kill you. It'll kill you. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Raise your hand. Nobody goes to the Grand Canyon and stands way out in the parking lot and says, you know, I think I see it over there. Nobody does that. When you go to the Grand Canyon, you want to get as close as you can to the canyon. And suddenly parents with little kids, as they're walking up toward the edge, they realize, wait a minute, there's no chain link fence. There's no guardrail. There's a sign that's posted that says, warning, do not go past this point. Stop. Because the closer you get to the edge of the Grand Canyon, the more you realize there's some danger here. And so you have to respect the Grand Canyon. I love the story of the little girl. The parents are taking her cross country. And they said, we're going to see all kinds of interesting things, historical, natural. And so they bought her a journal. And they said, when you see stuff that impresses you, write it down. Write it down so that you'll be able to look back years later and remember this trip. And so they go all the way across the country, and she doesn't write anything down. She writes nothing in her journal until they get to the Grand Canyon. And when they get to the Grand Canyon, the little girl looks, runs back to the car, gets her journal, and I mean, she's writing as fast as she can. And that night after she goes to bed, the parents, with great curiosity, opened the journal to see what she wrote. And they read these words. Today, I spitted a mile. So think about that the next time you go to the Grand Canyon. The beauty of that place, the grandeur of that place draws you near. But then you realize how dangerous this is. And you better respect it. It's the same with God. Moses is staring at the fire. Moses is mesmerized. But he realizes, I can't go in. Because what is beautiful is deadly. And that's why there can be no such thing as a bored Christian. Because our God is too attractive and our God is too dangerous to be boring. And what that says is, if God is boring, to you, you've never come face to face with the fire of his holiness. Why not? Because sometimes our faces are planted in screen world, our faces are planted in entertainment world, so that we don't notice his world or his word or his son. And we miss that relationship. We miss that connection. We miss the very purpose as to why we are here. Because you see, when you lose sense of who God is, you lose sense of who you are. And when you lose sense of who you are, then we begin to remake God in our image. And when we begin to remake God in our image, God gets smaller and smaller and smaller and we get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's when it happens. We get perturbed. Because God's not running the world the way I think it ought to be run. And so rather than being grateful for everything that we have that we don't deserve, we become entitled. And there's a great big news alert in all of this. That it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about his honor and his glory. I tell you, next time you go to the Grand Canyon and there's a bunch of people standing there and they're looking at the Grand Canyon, I tell you what you do. You walk around those people and then you get to the edge of the Grand Canyon and you turn around and you face all of those people who are looking at the Grand Canyon and you say, may I have your attention? 
I want everybody to look at me. I want everybody to see how awesome I am. They're going to look at you like you're an idiot because you'd be an idiot. Because nobody goes to the Grand Canyon to see you. It like, it's like nobody goes to the zoo. Nobody goes to the zoo to see the dachshund exhibit. You know the little wiener dog? You have a dachshund, don't you? Okay, I'm going to step out of it. Nobody goes to the zoo to see the poodle exhibit. Is that better? All right. Nobody goes to the zoo to see the poodle exhibit. Nobody goes up to the zookeeper and says, where do you keep the poodles? Nobody does that. We go to the zoo to see lions and tigers and bears. Why? Because lions and tigers and bears will rip your face off. That's why. That's what we want to see. And so we want to get close to the lions and tigers and bears, but not too close. Because you better respect them. You better respect them. We were in Glacier National Park last summer. And we'd seen all kinds of animals. We'd usually go in the evening. We would go in the evening when the tourist animals were leaving, and we'd go in the evening when the animal animals were coming out. And uh, we're going down the road, and there was a bush up ahead on the left, and the, the branches of this bush were just shaking like crazy. And I thought, something's in there. And so we got closer, we pulled off and got real quiet. There was a grizzly, and he's eating the berries. And we sat there and watched that grizzly, and a motorcycle started coming down the road. It kind of scared him a little bit. And he stepped out from the bush, and he stood up about eight feet tall. And my wife got out her iPhone, and she said, Oh, no, the memory's full. And she's trying to take a picture, and she's telling the bear to stand there. <laughs> Don't move. She's trying to delete stuff so she can take a picture, you know. I wonder why a lot of times people show up on a Sunday to come to church. Sometimes I think people show up, if we're not careful, to see the poodle exhibit. When we come to worship the holy, awesome God... The one who made the ball of fire in the sky so bright, you cannot even look at it. The sun, wholly attractive, wholly dangerous. And that same God likes to light a fire in all of us. We sing the song sometimes that says, Light the fire. In my heart today. Secondly, write this down. Like fire is intimate, so is the love of God. Like fire is intimate, so is the love of God. You ever build a campfire? A campfire just beckons you to pull up a chair. There's a sense of coziness. There's a sense of warmth. There's a sense of intimacy. We think campfire. We think friends and s'mores. When we adopted the three kids from Eastern Europe and they came home with us, when the plane landed, they didn't speak any, any English. A couple of weeks later, we're sitting out back on the patio and I built a fire in the fire ring and I said, we're going to make s'mores. And they said, what's that? I said, you'll see. So we taught them how to roast their marshmallows till they were just ready and to take that marshmallow and put it on a piece of Hershey's chocolate between two graham crackers, and I said, eat this. And they ate that, and they said, we want some more. <laughs> I said, there's the name. It's been so fun teaching them English and watching them mess it up. I, I, I would never want to learn English if I didn't already know it, and I don't know it well. <laughs> We were sitting at the table one evening. Leah had begun to date, date Jacob, and they're now married. And we're sitting there at the table one evening, and 
It was one of the first times Jacob was with us, and we had said the prayer, and we're passing food around. And Leah just blurts out, and she says, I'm feeling frisky. And Jacob choked on whatever it was he was eating. And I said, you're feeling what? And she said, I'm feeling frisky. I said, do you know what that means? She says, yeah, happy. I'm feeling happy. I said, well, not exactly. Huh. But English. Alex was in a fast food place and, the, you know, you stand there and he's trying to figure out what he wants. He's looking and looking and looking. And the guy says, come on, man. Alex said, why? I'm already here. <laughs> Just stuff like that we don't even think about, you know. Oh, the campfire. Here's a problem. God is who God is. God's not going to turn down the heat of his holiness so you can come near. Because his holiness is who he is. So how is this going to work? I want to come near. I want to come to where God is. I want to come next to him. But how is this going to work? It worked because God doesn't change himself. He's going to change you. And why is he going to change you? Because he loves you. He's going to make a way for you to come to the fire and not be burned. How's he going to do that? And I tell you, this jumped off the page at me. Verse 7, verse 8. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their sufferings. Now look at verse 8. Underline this in your Bible. So I have come down to deliver them. The ultimate God coming down would happen centuries later. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt with us. God coming down. And the same God who said to Moses, I am that I am, is used by Jesus. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's the only way you can come to the fire of God's holiness and not be burned. Why? Because he took death for you. He was burned for you. He went to the cross for you. Why? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. So that we can become the righteousness of God in him. Not in me, in him. And why would he do that? 3.16. God so loves the world that he gave his only son. That's how much he hates sin. But that's how much he loves you. God takes sin seriously, so seriously, that the only way for you to come into the presence of his holiness is by his holiness. And that's what Jesus offers. He offers forgiveness. He offers holy purifying. And ladies and gentlemen, when that happens, he in turn sets you on fire. And in a sense, you become the bush that doesn't burn up. Not because of you, but because of him. Light the fire in my heart today. Third, write this down. Like fire fuels motion, so is the power of God. Your car will not move without power. It has to have fuel, which costs a lot these days. <laughs> but that fuel combines with the ignition of a spark and the plug of that spark literally produces an explosion. And when that happens, there is explosion and then there is motion. That's how that works. And it's the same with Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Moses is running on empty until God filled his tank and gave him a spark of mission. And when that happened, there was in Moses an explosion motion. Go and bring my people home. 
You see, once you see the fire of God's holiness and you are consumed with the fire of God's love, then and only then will the fire of God's purpose explode in your heart. I think of Luke 24 and verse 32, the two men walking along the road to Emmaus, talking with this stranger who turned out to be Jesus, and later they were conversing among themselves, and they said, were not our hearts, listen to this, were not our hearts burning within us? When he spoke to us on the way. Or Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Tongues as a fire rested on each one of the apostles. God's fire lit them up. And they went out and turned the world upside down. So I have to ask, are you on fire or are you just going through the motions? God hasn't just saved you from something. Sin. God hasn't just saved you from something. He has saved you to go and do something. Because after all, we are the church of Jesus. We are a group of people who are supposed to be on fire. Are we? Or have we just become pew sitters? Is that all we are? You see, if there's no fire, there's no mission. If there's no mission, there's no church. And if there's no real church, all that's left is a group of bored people getting together on a Sunday and singing about a fire they wish they had. We need to pray, God, light us up. Light us up. Light us up so we don't burn up. Light us up so we in turn can set the world on fire. Because ladies and gentlemen, we're not here to be entertained. We're not here to go through life with our heads just locked on a screen. We're not here to just be amused. We are here on a mission. Go make disciples of all the nations. Go into all of the world. That's explosion motion. But if you're bored... It only means you've never walked close enough to the fire. And until you do, the gospel is for all will mean nothing to you. Where sin has gone must go his grace. The gospel is for all. Explosion, motion, light the fire in my heart today. Thank you all for your kind attention. Well, what a powerful introduction and a wonderful foundation upon which the rest of this week can be laid. We're going to stand adjourned for a few moments, and after which Tommy Peeler, I did see a sighting, and so we'll gather together to hear him. Thank you so much.
Well, throughout the week, we'll be talking about the gospel is for all, and you've noticed in the program, some sermons will be the gospel is for those who doubt, the gospel is for the desperate. Tommy Peeler is grateful this morning that the gospel is for the latecomer, and we're... <laughs> We're thankful for his safe arrival and for Brother Scott Powell over at Kleinwood, who was a, a college uh, mate of Tommy's who picked him up at the airport and brought him to the lectures this morning. This is Tommy's first and last appearance on the Southside Lectures. <laughs> He preaches in Indiana, but you'll soon tell that he's a native of Tennessee. And for a number of years, he was on the Bible faculty at Florida College, of which uh, Melissa and I are thankful our daughter, Morgan, is in his classes. And he is not only a good preacher, but he is a good man. And we're thankful for his agreeing to come and speak to us on the gospel is for all. For his first lecture, he's going to introduce God. We're talking about his gospel, and the reason it's so great is because of the glory and majesty of God. Brother Stevens will lead one song, and then we'll look forward to Brother Tommy's first lecture. To God be the glory. Go so. To God be the glory. Your prayers, I appreciate your desire to be pliable and Wilson uh, switching times with me. Uh, so many people to thank for that. I do appreciate Scott, the one important person I know in the airline industry, and uh, he uh, was very helpful in getting me here. But, but thank you for the privilege, and there'll be more things to say this week, and I hope to get to talk to all of you. But I want to tell you, 
The subject that I'm talking about today and the text that I'm talking about today is greater than I am. The key character in all of Scripture is God. The Bible is first and foremost about Him. We live the way we live in light of who He is. And so, this sermon cannot adequately express God in all of His glory. But we will attempt to look at God's description of himself in Isaiah chapter 40 and to be benefited from the process. A little bit about the context. Isaiah 40, Isaiah begins speaking of the return from Babylonian captivity. The amazing thing about that is because Babylonian captivity is still in the far future. He speaks not only of that during the days of Assyrian crisis, but he speaks even of the return from captivity. In captivity, the people would be broken and despondent, but they are not to give up on thoughts of the greatness of their God, the majesty of God. And particularly here in verses 12 through 17, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, a 1995 update. But in this text, it is going to extol God's greatness. It asks, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding and who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge? And informed him of the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, all, nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded as less than nothing and meaningless. First of all, notice in verse 12 some of the terms that we associate with building and construction. Terms like measuring and marking off. And, and there are other terms like weighing that are used here. This universe was created by the most skilled of all craftsmen. And he carefully laid out all that he made. Water covers three-fourths of the surface of the earth. But God is pictured as holding all the waters of the world in his cupped hand. The heavens are so immense that if you were to begin at one end of our galaxy and travel the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to get to the other edge of our galaxy and the distance between neighboring galaxies is greater than that and God spoke it all into existence. God measured off the heavens, these immense heavens, the text says in verse 12, by the span, which is usually viewed as the distance between a person's thumb and their small finger, in most men around nine inches. How big is God that he can measure off the immense heavens like that? How great is God? In his brief commentary on Isaiah, in the New Bible commentary, a one-volume commentary series, Derek Kidner said, the universe is dwarfed by the Creator. As immense as the universe is, the Creator is far greater than his creation 
If all of us could always be convinced of that, that would keep us from all wrong and would always keep us on his path. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Our God is not only infinite in his size, but in his wisdom in verses 13 and 14. He doesn't need to consult with anyone else. He doesn't need to take advice. He doesn't need to ask instruction. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has advised him? We could say that in regard to God's awesome work in creation or we could say that as Romans 11 verse 34 does in God's awesome work in salvation. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? In verse 15, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. Now again, Isaiah prophesying of the future that the people would go into captivity, but emphasizing that all the nations in their combined efforts are not going to thwart God's purpose. They cannot stand against this awesome God. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are like a drop from a bucket. Now this is a drop from a bucket from a God who holds all the waters of the world in his hand in verse 12. The Bible tells us in verse 15 they are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales when you see in verse 12 he calculates all the dust of the earth by measure now don't misunderstand that statement that is not a statement that God does not love the nations or care for the nations it will come about in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as top of the mountains and all nations will flow into it. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation. And neither shall they learn war anymore. God's vision of salvation in Isaiah 2 verses 2 through 4 encompasses all nations. And in passages like Isaiah 19, verses 18 through 25, Isaiah talked about Judah and Israel combining with Assyria and Egypt and all worshiping God together. God loves all nations and therefore, as Wilson quoted earlier, go therefore and teach all nations. God loves all nations. But if all of us combine all of our resources in rebellion to him, it does not change who he is and what he will accomplish. And verse 16 says, Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. If you were to take this immense forest of Lebanon and you were to cut down every tree and offer every animal in it as a sacrifice, that would be a sacrifice that would not be worthy of this God. All the nations are as nothing before him and they are regarded as less than nothing and meaningless. Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider the heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have made, David probably wrote that Psalm at night, looking up into the sky as he mentions the moon and the stars. And when I consider them all, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? Understanding how great God is. We're overwhelmed with how small 
We are. The wrong interpretation of the majesty and glory of God is that he is too big to care. But the right interpretation is he is too big to fail. We're going to make three points off of this. It's always good to have three points. And that's what the text gives us. And that's why we're going to emphasize three things. The first point that he makes, and it's a point that is made quite frequently through Isaiah chapters 40 through 48. But in Isaiah 40 verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman cast it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Understanding the greatness and the glory and the majesty of God, what is there that we can make that would adequately represent the Lord in all his glory? To whom then will you liken me? Or what likeness will you compare with me? The strongest rebuke of idolatry in all of Scripture is probably what's contained right here in Isaiah chapters 40 through 48. It's Isaiah 44, remember beginning around verse 9, that has that picture of the person who goes out into the forest and he cuts down a tree and he takes part of the tree and he puts it in the fire and he warms himself with it or he cooks over it and the other part he fashions and shapes into a God and he says, save us from our distresses, save us from our difficulties. He doesn't recognize the inconsistency between warming himself with part of the tree and worshiping the other part. It is interesting in that picture in Isaiah 44, the person who is building that altar works to the point that he is hungry and his strength fails and he becomes weary. I want to revisit that, Isaiah 44 verse 12, before we finish in our time. But, but notice all the skill and all the work that goes into making this idol. As for the idol, a craftsman cast it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, a silversmith fashions it with chains of silver. They are lavishing much wealth and much jewelry and many expenses upon this idol. And none of them, none of them can adequately represent God's glory. How in the world do we adequately represent the glory of a God who holds all the waters of the world in his hand, who marks off the heavens by the span? How do we represent his glory adequately? There's nothing we can make, there's nothing we can build that can adequately do that. The question, to whom will you liken me, is also used in verse 25. What you have in some of these verses that are up on the projector are verses in this section that rebuke idols and idolatry. Uh, certainly, you'll be benefited by writing those down and looking those up and thinking through them carefully. I also have up Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. In the Ten Commandments, this is stated. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness 
of what is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now there's a contrast there between God's anger and God's wrath in verse 5 and God's loving kindness in verse 6. That is worthy of being explored, but right now that is not what I'm going to focus on. Right now, I wanted to focus on that statement that I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. I want you to think about this. Why is that said right there? Why is that said right there? Haven't we seen cases where people violated other of these moral laws in the Ten Commandments? Where it brought great disaster on their families for generations to come. Let me illustrate. And I recognize that you know situations just like this. A man was a deacon in a congregation. Seemed like they had a good family. He leaves his wife for someone else. His wife is emotionally upset by this. Their children are. Their children have to go through much counseling in their lives. But because of his sin of adultery, nobody in that family ever darkens the door of a church building anymore. What I'm saying, God could have put after adultery God could have said, after you shall not commit adultery, that this is going to affect your family to the third and fourth generation. I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. But he doesn't say it there. He says it about you shall not make an idol. You shall not make a graven image. My point is not to minimize the seriousness of adultery. My point is to maximize the ideas that you are conveying to your children about God. Because the concepts that you have about God and the concepts that you are teaching your children and teaching your grandchildren, those concepts are going to have an impact long after you're gone. And may God help us. May God help us to always represent the truth about who he is. When we consider the glory and the majesty of God, it not only shows us the foolishness of pride, it also shows us It shows, it shows the foolishness of idolatry and it also shows the wickedness of pride. Look at verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Think about what this is saying about God. 
He stretches out the heavens. And says, he has to use these immense heavens that we described earlier. He has to use these as a tent for his presence. As Solomon prayed, will God indeed dwell on earth? The heavens and even the highest heavens cannot contain you. 1 Kings 8 verse 27. The heavens cannot contain God. And God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And this passage puts us in our place. We are like grasshoppers before him. We are small and we are totally dependent upon this awesome God for our existence. The Bible says in verse 23 that God reduces rulers to nothing. He makes judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted. Scarcely have they been sown. Scarcely has their stock taken root on the earth. But he merely blows on on them and they wither and the storm carries them away blowing and withering look back at verse 7 the grass withers the flower fades when the breath of God blows upon it there the breath of God blows upon the grass it withers here God is doing this with the most powerful people on earth with rulers and judges he is merely blowing on them and they are withering verse 25 to whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. God is infinite as creator and God is infinitely holy. This book of Isaiah uses that title in verse 25, the Holy One, 25 times. You know how much it's used in the other 38 books of the Old Testament? Six Isaiah emphasizes a God who is holy, holy, holy. To whom then will you liken me that I should be his equal? God is not only much greater than us as creator, he is much greater than us in the sense that he is absolutely holy and we have sinned and fallen short of his glory. In verse 26, lift up your eyes on high. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. In verse 26, lift up your eyes. Now those words were used in Deuteronomy 4 verse 19 when Moses was forbidding the people to lift up their eyes to the sun, moon, and stars for worship. They were told, don't lift up your eyes to worship the heavenly beings. But here they are told, lift up your eyes to see the one who has created them all. He calls them all by name. God told Abraham he can't count the stars in Genesis 15 verse 5. But he knows how many there are, and he placed each one of them there. But we looked at some of the specifics of the passage. Do you get the overall gist? When we consider how great God is, that God holds all the waters of the world in his hand, that God marks off the heavens by the span. How foolish is it of us to become proud? It was about 700 A.D., excuse me, 700 B.C., and Assyria was the most powerful nation on earth. Their king, Sennacherib, was making an attack on Hezekiah. And he said, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He addressed this to the people of Judah. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you, saying that your God will deliver you. He said, the other nations have said that. The other cities and peoples have said that. And where are their gods? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Where are the gods of Arpad? Where are 
the gods of these nations? And why is your God any different? What God can deliver from my hand? What God can deliver? Sennacherib becomes so intoxicated with his own power, he doesn't think any God can deliver from his hand. God delivered from his hand. A hundred years later, now the most powerful kingdom in the world is Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar has set up a golden image 90 feet high and he has called the people to worship before this image. And anyone who doesn't worship the image is going to be thrown in the midst of a burning and fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow. When word comes to the king, he is furious and calls them in for a private conference. He tells them if they're willing to worship his image, when he gives them a second chance, all this will be forgotten. But he says, if you don't, I'm going to throw you in the midst of a burning and fiery furnace. And what God... What God can deliver from my hand? Daniel 3 and verse 15. That's the key verse of that chapter with, connected with the answers given in that chapter that God is able to deliver. What God can deliver? Sennacherib said it. Nebuchadnezzar said it. And one day Nebuchadnezzar was walking around in Daniel 4 viewing the city of Babylon and says, Is not this this city that I built by my majesty and my power? And God said, you're going to be taken from among men and you're going to eat grass like an animal until you recognize the most high God rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to whomever he will. Now, I want you to understand something. All those illustrations I gave, Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, we're dealing with kings. We're dealing with kings. Powerful people, mighty people, like verse 23 and 24 mentioned, rulers and judges. Those are the ones we're talking about as being guilty of pride because I know and you know that we have never thought too much of ourselves. Have we? My oldest sons were 12 and 11, and um, I was their uh, fearless baseball coach uh, one summer, or a couple of summers. And we played every game. We only had four teams in the league. And you got to play each other three or four times and you knew basically what every player could do or couldn't do. You knew that. And we played one game, one game out of town that whole year. It was a team that was about 15, 20 minutes away. And being the diligent coach that I am, I was, I Studied this team, scouted them, went to a couple of innings of a game. And I noticed that they had good hitters, they had good right-handed hitters, but they hit the ball late and they hit the ball to right center quite frequently. And so I developed a great strategy. At that age group, you put, most of the time you put your best fielders in the infield. But I took our best defender and I put him in center. And I said, this is what they're going to do. They're going to hit the ball over to right center. And he said, I want you to shade yourself over that way. And when that ball is hit, you go after it. And if you catch it in the air, we're going to win this game. And on cue, the first player on that team, it may have been the first pitch, when he got up, he hit a hard line drive to right center. It was the kind of ball that in that age group just was not caught in the outfield. 
And our center fielder took a couple of steps over and just snatched the ball out of the air. And the umpire yells one out. And I looked over to see their other co those coaches confused and disoriented. And I thought to myself, you are a genius. You're a genius. <laughs> well, the rest of the game... They hit the ball to straight left and straight right. They hit the ball over the fence. <laughs> it went between the shortstop's legs. That was my son. <laughs> Everywhere except right center. And we lost 11 to 6. Why do I mention that illustration? I mention that illustration to say I am well aware of how easy it is at the smallest of successes for us to become impressed with who we are and with what we've done. If you are a young person who is very gifted athletically, or if you have a good personality and you make friends easily in school. If you are a working professional and you have shot to the top of your profession. Anything you've accomplished, you've only accomplished it. Because the God who holds the waters of the world in his hand and marks off the heavens by the span, it's only because he has given you the ability to do it. And our successes are not reasons for us to become enamored with ourselves, but they are reasons for us to thank God that he has allowed us to use our abilities to his glory. Yesterday morning I had the opportunity to preach on Matthew 11 verses 25 through 30. The part of the Bible, the great invitation. Come to me, all you who are lab labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But right before that, Jesus said, I praise you, Father. I praise you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and you've revealed them to babes because this was your good pleasure. I praise you that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent. Is being wise and intelligent a disqualification from the kingdom of God? No. But pride is. And pride often goes with it. I praise you that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and you've revealed them to infants. You've revealed them to babes. Is being ignorant a qualification for God's kingdom? No. But humility is. This week, let me implore you and myself to have the attitude of Samuel when he said, Speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. Speak. Because I'm listening. I'm not trying to determine what I like and what I don't like of the less. I'm trying to listen to see how I need to live and how I need to view God. May God forgive us. If we ever try to impress one person even with who we are instead of with who he is. May God forgive me for times I've done that. It should be so easy for us to humble ourselves before this God, understanding how great he is. 
the one who humbles himself will be exalted. But we, as human beings, are a strange combination. At one moment, we're so proud and arrogant. And the next moment, we're so discouraged and broken, we don't think we can take another step. In Isaiah 40, the greatness and the glory of God also is connected to the fact that God can sustain us when we are weak. Look at verse 27, beginning. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. Pay attention to how frequently those words weary or tired are used. He does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. <coughs> Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain you strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. As Judah experiences the trauma of Babylonian captivity, they will think God has forgotten about them. And the justice that they deserve has escaped them. They're going to think that. But God tells them, do you not know? Have you not heard? And notice how God is described there in verse 28. It emphasizes God's eternity. He is the everlasting God. It emphasizes God as creator. He is the everlasting God. He is the Lord, Yahweh. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. And he does not become tired or weary or weary or tired. He, he, he is an inexhaustible source of strength. Earlier I told you we would revisit Isaiah 44 and verse 12. Do you remember in Isaiah 44 verse 12 that the man who was making an idol in making the idol became hungry and thirsty and weary. And yet we serve a God that never becomes weary. These were becoming weary in making idols to represent him. How foolish to worship the idol instead of worshiping God in all his glory. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth <clears throat> does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. It is infinite as verses 13 and 14 it stated. God is an inexhaustible source of strength. And in verse 29, God gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. He's an inexhaustible source of strength and he is the source of our strength. You notice that the type of people in verse 30 who become weary and tired are youths and vigorous young men. They are the strongest and most capable. They are the most powerful, the most athletic there is a limit to their energy. There's a limit to their strength. Though youth grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly in contrast to the strongest and mightiest whose strength fails them and whose knees buckle, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. 
Is that stating that if you serve the Lord, you'll never experience discouragement, you'll never experience trouble, you'll never experience difficulties? No. But the everlasting God who is an eternal source of strength can hold us up in the midst of those difficulties. The Lord has sheltered and protected me from a whole lot of things. That he's not protected all of you from. And I don't know your stories here. But over the years, I've appealed to this passage in a lot of different situations. I can think of a friend who came home early from a business trip and he was so excited about doing this, coming home early and surprising his wife. And he did surprise her. He found her with someone else. And I heard it the other way. Of husbands who were traveling for business who really had no business at all. Except to see someone else in another city. And I know there are people who have lost their mates. Their husband and their wife. And I have used this passage on a couple of occasions. Talking to people who were Christians, whose children were murdered. And in both of these two cases, it was known who did it? And they got off. One claiming self-defense. I am not qualified to give you advice in those areas based upon my experience I'm not qualified and in real and really I hope I never am but all I can do is point you to this God who is able to hold us up and sustain us when we don't have any strength to go on But I will tell you, that their stories, and I don't want to go into do too much detail, and I don't want to give away any identities. But the very fact those people are still serving God is proof of this passage. It's proof that God can hold them up. That God can strengthen them and sustain them in the midst of their problems. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. And they will walk and not become weary. And I don't know what you're going through right now. And I know it's always easier to give advice than it is to live it. But somehow, some way, this God can hold you up and sustain you. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, how awesome you are. 
How glorious, how majestic, how powerful you are. You hold the waters of the world in your hand. You mark off the heavens by the span. You calculate the dust of the earth by measure. And may this text, O God, lead us to stand in awe of you. Forgive us for our inadequate concepts of you. For we know that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Forgive us of our inadequate concepts. And may we convey a true picture of you to our children and grandchildren that may serve them well their whole lives. And Lord, we pray you forgive us for the times that we've become proud, for the times that we have thought too highly of ourselves. And may it never be that we boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those who are weak, for those who are broken, For those who don't think they can take another step, even maybe one's with us this morning. We pray, God, that you hold them up, strengthen them, and support them. Sustain them. And bring them safely to heaven. We are all weak. We are all frail. And we need your help, your forgiveness, and your strength. And we praise you for Jesus in his name. Amen. Now, friend, if you are not in a right relationship with God, you have no greater need than that. This God who was so big who was so mighty that he spoke the worlds into existence. There is no need you have that's greater than the need to be right with him. If you believe this God and you believe that he sent his son to die for us, Why not turn from your sins and repentance, turn from the way you're walking and turn toward him and be baptized for remission of sins? The brethren here, Bubba, and the brethren here would be glad to help you as we stand and sing. a moment and then brother Larry McClenny if you'll come and lead our dismissal prayer this morning we're so grateful that you've come to be with us on this first morning 
and we're just getting started. We have a wonderful week before us, and we're indebted to our first two speakers. We invite you tonight at 7, we'll have a period of congregational singing for 30 minutes, and Brother Stevens will lead that. And then we'll hear from Lawrence Kelly at 7.30. The gospel is for those who are nothing like Jesus. And at 8.30, Shane Scott, the gospel is for those who doubt. One of the other mainstays of the lectures through the years has been Brother Brent Lewis. He has uh, been here as a visitor and a preacher for almost every program. And we learned this morning that his wife, Joy, passed away. We announced yesterday that she'd been placed in hospice care, and uh, our prayers this morning can be of thanksgiving that she did not suffer long. But we want to pray for Brent and his family that they will be comforted during this time. You'll notice on the lecture brochure that there's an order form. If you'd like to order CDs or DVDs of the lectures, you can fill that out and place it in a container in the foyer. The uh, elders have also prepared some special visitor cards just for the lectures. If you're visiting and you have a need that we can help you with, uh, you can fill that out and also place it in the box in the foyer. Uh, Tommy Peeler, not only in uh, coming to preach this week, is helping us with our theme, The Gospel is for All, because he has provided some Bibles, both in English and Spanish, that we're going to uh, distribute after these uh, set after we're dismissed this morning and we have some volunteers who have uh, offered to help we're just going to hold up signs also that Tommy has provided for people passing by the building that they can pull in and uh, and have a free bible so we'll begin that shortly after we're dismissed and uh, we'll uh, uh, invite your uh, uh, understanding of that's why maybe we'll not be able to, to visit or, or stay after, but we want to get started so that uh, uh, we can begin distributing those Bibles. Thank you again for your presence. We invite you back tonight at 7. Oh, lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Gracious Heavenly Father, we feel so honored to be here in your presence. We're so thankful for the powerful message, messages by Wilson and Tommy. Help us to always be excited about serving you. May we always be excited about your word and the great opportunities we have to preach and teach it to other people. Help us in to always let our light shine that people may see our good works and glorify you as our Father in heaven. We're thankful for these men and their abilities and their love for you, the fact that they can motivate us to be better people, that we might truly love one another, continue to have peace and harmony as far as brethren, May we love the brotherhood, our Christians everywhere, and may we pray for one another that we might 
do better, be better, and try to do our best to teach people about the gospel message. We're saddened by the news of the death of Joy Lewis. We're so thankful for her life, her love for you, and the, her love for Brent, and her love for people. Be with Brent in this time of sorrow, but also a time of joy for the hope we have in heaven. Help us to continue to pray for him and pray for his family. And help us to be what we ought to be, that we might have heaven as our home. In Christ's name, amen.